In this video, you will learn more information about foreshadowing with additional examples that were not covered in class. So as you know, there are 11 different types of foreshadowing plants. Um, according to Rust Hills, author of writing in general and the short story in particular, um, in description is the first one. Not all descriptions are foreshadowing. Some descriptions are foreshadowing. And if a description is foreshadowing the setting, um, then we'll see a description of the place where the action of the story takes place. Uh, the description can also help convey the mood or tone of a story, and the description could also foreshadow um, how a character behaves. So in The Landlady by Roald Dahl, the first paragraph is um, descriptive and it gives us um, some foreshadowing plans using description. Billy Weaver had traveled down from London on the slow afternoon train with a change at Swindon on the way, and by the time he got to Bath, it was about nine o'clock in the evening, and the moon was coming up out of a clear starry sky over the houses opposite the station entrance. But the air was deadly cold, and the wind was like a flat blade of ice on his cheeks. So we have some foreshadowing and description here with the description of the, the wind, deadly cold and how it felt flat blade of ice um, when you usually think of a blade you think of a knife um, and then just deadly is foreshadowing in and of itself the second type of foreshadowing plant that might be used is uh, a symbol so in order to understand how symbols are used in foreshadowing we need to know what a symbol is um, a symbol is something that represents or stands for something else. When you see symbols in literature, they could be a foreshadowing plant in a few different ways. Um, the entire story could symbolize something. I think that's uh, really clear with fables like the tortoise and the hare. Um, an object can symbolize something, and the example in the text we read was a broken bowl could symbolize the breakdown of a character or an action could in and of itself be symbolic. So when we think of symbols in literature, uh, one thing we want to pay close attention to are plants and flowers, because plants and flowers have symbolic meanings. And uh, for example, basil, if, if you see basil in a story, um, it means good wishes. Chrysanthemums, are, they're a type of flower and they symbolize death. Um, a daffodil symbolizes unequal love, an oak symbolizes strength, and when you're old enough to start sending flowers to your um, significant other, you want to know that a red rose symbolizes love, and that's what you want to send the person, but a yellow rose symbolizes jealousy, and maybe you don't want to send yellow roses. Um, and these are just a few examples of symbolism using plants. They're all, anything can be a symbol um, as long as it represents something else. And what's interesting about symbols is they are also cultural. So I might not understand that chrysanthemums um, are symbolic of death because I'm a citizen of the United States and this is my culture. Whereas if I were a citizen um, in various countries in Europe, then I would know that a chrysanthemum symbolizes death. The third type of foreshadowing is in parallelism, and this is when the actions of the main plot of a story mirror or are similar to the action in the subplot of the story. So when we think of Finding Nemo, the movie, um, both characters, Marlin the dad and Nemo the son, are experiencing similar danger in their search for each other. So this is where we see some parallels. Um, it could be in characters' experiences, and in Finding Nemo, it was a dangerous deed. Marlin has to dive deep to find the dentist's goggles and escape the fish with enormous teeth, and he is nearly killed. And around that same time, Nemo has to stop the aquarium filter from working and he is also nearly killed. So these plot points here are paralleling each other. 
Another example of parallelism could be in a character's actions. And in Finding Nemo, the parallelism we see with the actions is being a parent. We see that Marlin has been controlling. Um, he's been a controlling parent and he's giving Nemo very little freedom. And the parallel structure that we see is Crush the turtle. Crush is a very laid back parent. He lets his um, offspring explore and figure things out. Um, Crush tells Marlin, whoa, kill the motor, dude. Let us see what the little man does flying solo. And uh, instead of controlling his son's actions, he gives his son the freedom to, to learn. And this is the polar opposite of what Marlin has done throughout the film. And so we see these parallel moments of um, different types of parenting styles. The fourth example is in chronological inversion. And this is when the author tells the reader the ending of the story at the beginning of the story. When readers read books or view films or television programming with in chronological inversion, they don't read or view the piece to find out how something happened we've already been told. They they engage in the piece to find out why something happened. Um, another uh, aspect of in chronological inversion is the use of flashbacks as a plant, um, as a way to foreshadow an event. So the best example I could think of of in chronological inversion is the prologue to The Secret History, which I'm going to read through quickly so you get the idea of it. The snow in the mountains was melting and Bunny had been dead for several weeks before we came to understand the gravity of our situation. He had been dead for 10 days before they found him, you know. It was one of the biggest manhunts in Vermont history. State troopers, the FBI, even an army helicopter. The college closed, the dye factory in Hamden shut down, people coming from New Hampshire, upstate New York, as far away as Boston. It is difficult to believe that Henry's modest plan could have worked so well despite these unforeseen events. We hadn't intended to hide the body where it couldn't be found. In fact, we hadn't hidden it at all, but had simply left it where it fell in hopes that some luckless passerby would stumble over it before anyone even noticed he was missing. This was a tale that told itself simply and well. The loose rocks, the body at the bottom of the ravine with a clean break in the neck, the muddy skid marks of dug in hills pointing the way down, a hiking accident, no more, no less. And it might have been left at that, at quiet tears and a small funeral, had it not been for the snow that fell that night. It covered him without a trace. And 10 days later, when the thaw finally came, the state troopers and the FBI and the searchers from town all saw that they had been walking back and forth over his body until the snow above it was packed down like ice. Though I remember the walk back and the first lonely flakes of snow that came drifting through the pines, remember piling gratefully into the car and starting down the road like a family on vacation, with Henry driving clenched jaw through the potholes and the rest of us leaning over the seats and talking like children. Though I remember only too well the long, terrible night that lay ahead and the long, terrible days and nights that followed, I have only to glance over my shoulder for all those years to drop away and I see it behind me again. The ravine, rising all green and black through the saplings, a picture that will never leave me. I suppose at one time in my life, I might have had any number of stories, but now there is no other. This is the only story I will ever be able to tell. So that's the prologue of the secret history. And what we learn as we view this, as we read the prologue, um, we know that someone and a guy named Henry and a couple of other people killed this boy named Bunny. Um, Bunny was his nickname. And so now we're not reading to find out who killed Bunny. We know, we know who did it. We're reading to find out why Bunny was killed, why they killed Bunny. And then it goes back in time to the, chapter one goes back in time to the moment the narrator first saw all the characters, um, including Bunny, alive. So the fifth way to foreshadow is using dialogue. Um, I think it's important to know that not all dialogue is foreshadowing, but some dialogue will give hints to the readers about the action that may follow. Sometimes the dialogue may be something that the character says what they're going to do. They state their intentions. Um, it also could be a slip of the tongue. They said something accidentally, and what they said accidentally is now becomes a foreshadowing plant. 
Um, or it could be a seemingly random conversation. And here's the thing to remember with literature. Nothing happens at random. Everything is very purposeful. So when you are seeing a random conversation, you need to be alert for, for foreshadowing because you're most likely seeing a plant. The example we're going to look at is from The Monkey's Paw by W.W. W. Jacobs. And in this, um, Mr. and Mrs. White and their son Herbert are waiting for a visitor, the Sergeant Major Morris, to come see them on a stormy. And they are talking about the Sergeant Major's uh, time in India. I'd like to go to India myself, said the old man, just to look around a bit, you know. Better where you are, said the Sergeant Major, shaking his head. He put down the empty glass and sighing softly, shook it again. I should like to see those old temples and fakirs and jugglers, said the old man. What was it that you started telling me the other day about a monkey's paw or something, Morris? Nothing, said this soldier hastily. Leastways, nothing worth hearing. So here in this dialogue, Sergeant Major Morris has made two things clear. Um, probably it's better not to go to India and he doesn't want to talk about this monkey's paw that he's mentioned already. Um, so now these are two foreshadowing plants. Why is Mr. White better not going to India? Why does the soldier not want to talk about this now, even though he's clearly brought it up before? Um, and so those are the foreshadowing plants in the dialogue. Our sixth um, foreshadowing plant is in sequentiality or progression. So the sequence of events is tied to an emotional tone of the story. Um, and the progression of the story and the tone gets more intense as the story continues. The tone could become um, darker, it, beca it could become lighter, but the tone and the events progress in a sequence that becomes more and more intense. Um, so one example of this is the Harry Potter series. As you read through the series and as you view the films, the movies themselves become darker. And this is clearly represented in the opening credits of and closing credits of the films. So when we start um, first watching Harry Potter, uh, we see that, you know, it's a pretty bright Warner Brothers, um, but even still it's kind of dark right there with the title. Um, so these are the first four movies and you see that um, it, the imagery becomes darker. And then when we get to the last four movies, we see the imagery that we see right at the beginning of the film becomes darker still. And so this is just a visual representation of how the tone becomes more intense um, in, in this instance, a series of eight films. Speaking of tone, uh, the tone is the seventh way that an author might foreshadow um, events that happen toward the end of the story. The tone is the feel of a piece of writing. Um, it is more than a mood piece. Uh, the tone helps express the author's attitude toward the subject matter of the text. So um, you might hear a tone that is mocking or um, filled with anger, and this would be done with word choice and imagery and similes and metaphors. So our example of tone is from The Landlady by Roald Dahl, which we've already read. And so as we think about the tone and how it sets the tone, we have a slow afternoon train with the change at Swindon. And by the time the character got there, it was nine o'clock in the evening, so it's already dark. The moon was coming up out of a clear starry sky, so the moon's not even fully out. It's still rising. Um, and the houses opposite, uh, the houses were opposite the station entrance. And now we have deadly cold um, wind and the air like a flat blade of ice on his cheeks. Now, some of you are like, what? I thought that was description. And you're right. Here's where it gets kind of messy with foreshadowing. They can overlap. It can be more than one type of uh, one technique. And in this instance, we see Roald Dahl using tone to benefit the description um, that he's writing in the first paragraph. And they are both foreshadowing plants. So our eighth foreshadowing technique is theme. 
Um, in a piece of literature, a theme is the author's message or view about life and how people behave. And sometimes that theme is clearly stated. It's, it's explicit. You can find it in a sentence in the piece itself. Um, sometimes it's not explicit. The reader has to infer the theme because it is implicit. It is not clearly stated. And when we're able to determine a theme that the author is trying to convey through literature, uh, we're able to help us use that theme to figure out the events and understand the events at the end of the story. So in, in The Monkey's Paw, um, this is a continuation of where we left off before. Sergeant Major Morris said, I don't want to talk about this monkey's paw. Mr. White pressed him, and so Sergeant Major Morris starts talking. He says, to look at the Sergeant Major fumbling in his pocket, uh, said, it's just an ordinary little pod fried to a mummy. He took something out of his pocket and proffered it. That means offered it. Mrs. White drew back with a grimace, but her son, taking it, examined it curiously. And what is there special about it? inquired Mr. White as he took it from his son and having examined it, placed it upon the table. It had a spell put on it by an old fakir, said the Sergeant Major, a very holy man. He wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives and those who interfered with it did so to their sorrow. He put a spell on it so that three separate men could each have three wishes from it. So this uh, passage that's highlighted in red Fate ruled people's lives and those who interfere with it do so to their sorrow. That's a theme that's in this piece, The Monkey's Paw, and it's explicitly stated. So if we know that that's a theme and we know it's a foreshadowing plant, and we know that three men had could have three wishes from the monkey's paw, then the inference we must make is that the result of the wishes wasn't a positive one. It was a sorrowful one. So this is how a theme may foreshadow events um, at the end of a story. The next example, number nine, in various cork devices. And in order to understand this one, we have to think back to Greek plays. And uh, William Shakespeare did this as well. Um, a chorus, the choric, part, the chorus, is an actor or a group of actors. And what they do is they make comments about the action that's happening or about to happen in a play. They're not main characters. Their only job is making comments. Um, the modern day version of this is the voiceover in television and movies. And the best example I can think about uh, two people making comments about action that's happening with main characters and the people making comments are outside of the action um, is the Princess Bride. So we have the grandfather and the grandson um, reading this book, The Princess Bride. The grandfather is reading it to his grandson. The grandson has been sick. Um, and this was before video streaming and cell phones. So the grandson didn't really have that much to do. Um, and as they're reading the story, we become wrapped up with the lives of the characters and they show up as people on our screens. And every once in a while, the grandson or the grandfather will make a comment about the action that's happening um, with the characters in Florence. And in that moment, they're acting as a chorus, um, foreshadowing events that are to come. Our penultimate type of foreshadowing is intromissions of the supernatural. Uh, penultimate means second from the end. And this is when an author uses a supernatural element as a foreshadowing plant. So fortune telling, palm reading, magical spells, enchanted tokens, horoscopes, prophecy, tarot cards, reading tea leaves. There are so many other supernatural elements I could have named. Um, it's not just limited to these, but let's go back to the monkey's paw and um, read that passage again where Mr. White says monkey's paw and Sergeant Major Morris says, well, it's just a bit of what you might call magic, perhaps. OK, we're already there with intermissions of the supernatural, um, said the Sergeant Major Morris offhandedly. And what is there special about it, inquired Mr. White, as he took it from his son and, having examined it, placed it upon the table. It had a spell put on it by an old fakir, said the Sergeant Major Morris, 
said the sergeant major, a very holy man. He wanted to show that fate ruled people's lives and those who interfered with it did so to their sorrow. He had a spell put on it so that three separate men could each have three wishes from it. So here we have an overlap again. Um, I just finished telling you that fate ruled people's lives um, and those who interfered with it did so to their sorrow was a theme um, of the monkey's paw and it is but it's also um, an intermission of the supernatural. So here we have another example where they've doubled up. Um, he put a spell on it. Three men can have three wishes. And so here, when we have magical elements invoked in a story, um, we have to ask ourselves, why is this magical element here? What might it be preparing me for? And the ultimate one, which means last, um, is in after shadowing. And I thought a lot about this one and how to explain it because for me, it's one of the most confusing ones. Um, and as I was thinking about it, I realized that the word we might use um, instead of after shadowing is callback. Um, it's a callback. So after shadowing is the subtle callback near the end of the story that makes the reader think of some event that took place at the beginning of the story. And authors sometimes spend a, you know, a, a really long time, especially in a series, um, with after shadowing, figure out how to figuring out how to call back to something that happened earlier. And the best example I can think of that happened uh, that's happened in uh, cinema history is um, is in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. When we think about the character of Iron Man, this callback was 11 years in the making. At his first press conference, when everybody's like, who is Iron Man? Why is he here? Everybody told um, Tony, don't tell them you're Iron Man. And his ego is so much that he told them anyway, I am Iron Man, he said at the press conference. And then right after Thanos said, I am inevitable, and went to snap his fingers and realized he didn't have the Infinity Stones, um, Iron Man said, I am Iron Man. And that was a callback to the very first episode um, in to the very first movie in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, interestingly enough, Robert Downey Jr., the actor who plays Tony Stark, had to be convinced to say that line. He thought it would um, take away from the overall effect of the ending, and I think we can all agree that it did not. So those are the 11 types of foreshadowing plants. I hope that you update your definitions so that they're ones that you can understand a little bit better for yourself, and um, let me know if you have questions.